Manilius, in the first book of uh, Astronomica, after the description of the zodiac, begins the treatment of the celestial axis, the imaginary line which intersects the two poles of the sphere. Manilius' exposition is divided into three parts. A frame in which the poet focuses his attention on the poles, the treatment of the incorporality and immobility of the axis opposed to the whirling of the celestial sphere mass. The discussion ends with uh, two exological verses that summarize the entire didactis didactic exposition and uh, propose an explanatory etymology for the celestial axis. In Aratus, the text uh, number one, and also in the Latin translations, the treatment of the axis placed immediately after the premium precedes the description of the constellation. The poet insists on the immobility of the axis in opposition to the movement of the stars on the sphere, which is constant over time. Through this exposition, the poet provides to the reader a simple cosmographic introduction, since it uh, established two, two fundamental principles in his astronomy, the whirling of the celestial sphere and this equilibrium. The Ratus exposition represents the starting point for the axis of description in Manilius. The Latin poet, however, amplifies his model in a less uh, synthetic treatment. Manilius instead shapes uh, his didactic exposition through the insistent, insistent repetition of two concepts, the statistic and the materiality of the axis, opposed to the mobility and materiality of the cosmos. Uh, for the purpose of this communication, it would be good uh, to proceed with a rapid analysis, uh, analysis of the Manilius text. At a line uh, 279, after the preamble on the poles, is mentioned the subject uh, of the discussion. It seems that uh, the poet, patting the term axis and the end of the, of the verse, tries to create a sense of expectation in the reader. The first quality of the axis that is pointed out by Manilius and is, uh, it's, uh, is in is incorporeal nature, and the poet do it through the adjective tenuis and the verb deduco. Interesting to note that the verb in the deduco refers to the vocabulary of writing drawings and uh, in the vocabulary of geometry can indicate the tracing of a line. We can see other, other elements of a geometrical vocabulary uh, at the line 284, axis directus constitit orbis. As the duco, also the rigo in Latin can mean to draw a line. Um, the participle directus has a clear spatial value and conveys the geometric idea of perpendicularity. The axis piv uh, pivoted at uh, the two ends of the sphere intersects the earth globe in the middle and forms a right angle with the two polar point, Venus arctus at the line 283. The the axis keeps in balance the cosmos on the two opposite, opposite poles. Libratumque regit diverso cardine mundum at line 280. Manilius in uh, this verse is very close to Germanicus, phenomena 20 and 21. Libratasque tenet terras et cardine firmo orbe magit. That translates Aratus phenomena 22, eche da talanto napante. Librare indicates the equilibrium of the celestial spheres and above all the earth since Cicero and is a part of Latin cosmological vocabulary used even in poetry, in didactic and scientific context, not only in Germanicus and Mandilius but also in Ovid. The universe instead is conceived as a scale. Libratus represents a very close calc of a Greek atalantos. In this verse, the cosmic mass lies in a constant equilibrium. In this way, it is not surprising that expression widely used in cosmological context, as pendere or librare ponderibus, occur in the vocabulary of wakes and misers. Therefore, it wouldn't seem out of place hypothesized that Manilius, even in the treatment of the celestial axis, could refer to cosmological horizons that conceive the cosmos as a large building constructed and regulated by rational providence. The cosmic axis seems to be a sort of agent of providence, as, as can be inferred from the expression mundum regere, borrowed from the language of philosophy and theology. Instead, it is the instrument through which the nature realizes their is national uh, order, which is tangible image and theological proof of the, pres of the presence of divinity. 
In the following, in the following verse, 281, Sidereus Kirka Medium Quem Volvitur Orbis, the attention of the poet move, moves, from, moves on the subject of the cosmic motion. From a perbaton, Manilius placed particular emphasis on the celestial sphere and his, and his movement, object of the argumentation of this verse. In fact, at line 282, the, express, the expression volvitur orbis is recalled by Rotet Cursus, the whirling movement of the sphere of the sky keeps the universe and uh, the earthly globe in balance. At the line 285 uh, sorry, begins the second movement of the argumentation. Manilius returns on the subject as he had previously explained, repeating the late motif of the immateriality and immobility of the axis. In these verses, the poets throw together a series of terms with a marked material and bodily meaning, which indicates the qualities that axis doesn't, doesn't possess. In two lines, recall the adjective solidus, gravis, or the substantives vis, corpus, pondus, words that uh, often are used for uh, represent the universe and uh, its mass. Pondus is a term of astronomical vocabulary widely used, which indicates the cosmic mass. Also, corpus and onus are used in this sense. Therefore, the axis, which is defined by the negation of different quality characteristic of the cosmos, is able to sustain what is heavier in the nature, that is the universe. The line 289 summarizes what, uh, what has been expressed by the previous examiners and serves as a link with the subsequent exposure, focus, uh, focus instead on uh, the axis in materiality. Indeed, at line 290, Manilius repeated the adjective tenuis as a key word. The sense of the adjective is underlined by the, cosmic cl uh, by the consecutive clause ad ut, the clause in ring composition, the second part of the didactic ex exposition. The ecstatic nature of the axis, which, is, uh, which in this verse seems to be personified, is, uh, render is rendered through a clever play of allusions. The characterization of the movement is uh, accentuated by the present pleonastic of volito and movio, which is contrasted by a verb of sight. In the passage, the visual dimension, dimension decreases because the axis isn't an image. However, the, uh, the poet doesn't give up training to uh, describe the uh, invisible object. The tenuitas is, uh, in fact, a fundamental qualitative characteristic of this object, the axis devoid of matter, is also devoid of image. The description works, however, on the level of the, of the effects that the pivot of the sky has on the whole cosmos, the balance and the movement. All didactic exposition, therefore, constructed by a double order of opposition, the first between uh, the immaterial likeness of what holds the universe and the heaviness of the matter that forms the cosmos, the second between the, uh, the mobility of the axis and the movement of the sky. The strong opposition built by the poet through a repetitive uh, didactic exposition in which uh, few and clear concepts are marked suggests uh, to the reader a sense of paradox. The equilibrium of the cosmos and its movement is guaranteed by an object that uh, hasn't form and weight, but which is able, however, to support an enormous matter. The paradoxal effect is underlined by the manner in which Manilius exposes and describes his quality. The axis is described instead through the negation of his qualities. It doesn't move, but sees the universe moving. Motum non abet ullum, ipsa videt circa volitantia cuncta moveri. He hasn't matter, nec vero ex e solido stat corpore, nec grau e pondus abet, but holds the words regit mundum. Sublime. The cosmological picture that Manilius illustrates in the passage seems to suggest the idea of a grandiose world that, through these verses, is outlined to the reader in his enormous dimension. In, his, in this exhibition, therefore, in order to accentuate the idea of the greatness of the cosmos, the poets refer to a sublime imaginary that uh, we have to consider in this way the expression at line 243, Magni per inania mundi, through the empty space of the great sky as translated gold. The void is a particularly important point of stoic reflection concerning the incorporeal beings. 
first, first of all, analyzing uh, this problem must to be made a distinction between the void inside the cosmos and the external one. If outside the cosmos for the stoa was necessary to conceptualize the void, inside the universe, on the other hand, it wasn't at all admissible because it would undermine the cosmic unity. James Porter, who studied the manifestation of the sublime in ancient poetic, analyzed the text of Manilius without paying closer attention to the passage under examination. For the scholar, the treatment of the void by Manilius would be a significant sign of the presence of material sublime of Lucretian origin, which is achieved through precise linguistic echoes and allusion to concepts, at least in appearance, eccentric to stoic cosmology that informs the astronomic. The Manilian choice at, at partly uh, constitutes an inconsistency with a supposed stoic orthodoxy, which can be explained no, not only as a literary but also as scientific necessity. The attention to the sublime and the connection to concepts that refer to atomistic scenario are to be seen in the light of allusion to a poetic dialogue with Lucretius, the Latin progenitor of the uh, didactic poetry. Indeed, the expression magnum per inane is a clear uh, Lucretian verbal echo. The intertextual reference reveals as pointed by Portet, not a willingness to refute or compete with Lucretius, but the intention to use the same expressive and theoretical tools. We should ask at this point if the mention to the void is a tribute to Lucretius or it could have a deeper meaning in terms of poetic construction than it doesn't constitute therefore a simple filler in the context characterized by a marked expressive redundancy. Uh, in the, pas the presence in the passage of a uh, stylistical refined language, sidereus, aetereus, uh, combined with the uh, terms uh, of the cosmological vocabulary, libratum, pondus, as well as the polished rhetorical structures, are all things that should arouse our attention because demonstrate the great attention paid by Malindus to the topic. The author intends to represent the axis Miss Grandor. For this reason, in order to compose an incisive uh, didactic exposition, use the instrument of the Lucretian sublime. The cosmological notion of the axis has a defined relevance in the description of the cosmos. In fact, Manilius used a language to that alludes to the great models of sublime didactic poetry. The recourse to the sublime, indeed, can be considered as a proof of, of the Manilius' attempt to compose an inspired poem in which aesthetic purpose and theoretical instances are deeply related. In the Manilian passage, indeed, we can see the presence of an uh, Empedoclean, Hennian, Lucretian sublime, an aesthetic cate category pointed out by Hardy, Thomas Hardy, in uh, Virgil or in the didactic speech of Pythagoras in uh, Ovid's Metamorphosis. The Manilius Astronomica could be included in a specific literary tradition that, in Latin words, refers to Ennius and Lucretius in which the poetic word is uh, the exclusive instrument for communicating the most important scientific contents, contents. The category of the sublime, indeed, is a device for which the inspired didactic poet can achieve his gnosological task that is realized by a poem that is configured as the only medium for the knowledge of the cosmos. To conclude, Manilius, to describe the invisible, doesn't use, as Lucretius do, an analogic process and doesn't uh, identify the axis in the figure of Atlas uh, as Virgil. First of all, the poet remarks the immateriality and immobility of the axis and defines the quality uh, in a negative way. See, for example, the repetition of in an afro of neck. In the passage, are uh, stimulated the by the poet the imaginative skills of the reader, who must strive to trace in his mind the forms of an object incorporeal. In the second movement, the exposition uh, concentrates on the effects, the quality and the potentials of the axis through an, ev an evocative and sublime cosmological language. For this reason, the poet marks, makes use of uh, concepts for range to his philosophical background. The order of the cosmos, which is realized through the axis, come to be inserted in the context of infinite and void universe, different from the design of the traditional two-sphere cosmology. 
these effects are of order and balance and however emphasized in a repetitive didactic exposition by rhetoric of paradox and operates both on the level of the contents and uh, on the form. Thank you for your attention.